I was going to, uh, we're missing about eight people, which I, that's the one, arrive on time for shows, will you? Um, but, uh, and, uh, but I think we've got to get going. Uh, it makes them feel uh, terribly embarrassed when they come. But all of us. I was uh, thinking before coming today about uh, how I would describe what it is our, our objective is in these next uh, six Mondays, and I really don't have a good, a good conclusion yet. I thought, of, uh, I thought I would consult one of my favorite sources, and uh, his response to me is, well, they'll either appreciate music better, or you're going to show them really well how to hide their ignorance. <laughs> Uh, we're going to try for the first part, all right? That would be it. We're so well brought up in Canada, you're already in lines and in rows. I tell you, the second half, after we take a break, after the first hour, um, the first of the uh, live ensembles in this, uh, in this series will be here. And I'm asking you now, when they come, I'm going to ask them to set up approximately where you folks are right now. And could we sit around them? We get so few chances to do that at a concert. I want you to sit close. Don't, don't, let's not make a concert. I want you to get to get in close to them when they come. Tonight is a, a brass quintet. And, uh, you know, subtle beginning. Subtle beginning. <laughs> I want you to come back. So I thought, you know, we we'll start out with a brass band and see if, see if I can't keep your attention. <laughs> the, uh, list, uh, the list of the various, um, various evenings is going to have to be altered. The evenings aren't altered, but what occurs on them will be altered. You'll get everything that it says. It's just it's going to happen at a different time. Next week, um, due to plan bad planning on my part, I am going to be uh, in, uh, in Europe. But the, the evening with jazz, which had always been planned to feature William Westcott, who is a brilliant jazz musician. He's going to be bringing uh, an ensemble. He's a pianist. He's a composer. He's a wonderful lecturer himself. Lots of experience. He'll be taking next week. And then we'll go right back into, that would have been the grand finale. So you get, you get dessert first, is how this is all working out, OK? So we're going to have Bill next week, and uh, then the week after that, we'll pretend to go back to the schedule. So nothing's missing, only the nights have been changed to protect us. All right. Um, we'll be here every night but one. On, uh, I believe it's the 2nd of November, this, this room is booked, and we'll be just across the hall. It says committee, committee one, or is it the 3rd? No, sorry, thanks. November 3rd, we'll be across the hall. But otherwise, still up on this floor, by that time, I think we should be divided with a fair degree of ease. Most expensive parking, I think, is directly below us here. If you find something better, tell me about it. Um, it's 220, it's 225 after 6 under the library. Under the library? Oh, all, all Grand. All right, there you go. What I'm going to try and do is to get us all, that includes me, farther along on the road to what we call musical sophistication, which at concerts and operas in plays is almost invariably measured in the amount of mink that you can see at the reception or the interval, but it has nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing to do with it. In fact, the greater amount that there is, I think it's the inversely proportionate to the level of understanding of just what exactly went on. To become musically sophisticated, my contention is all we really need is desire. To become musically sophisticated, we really need to be desirous of becoming that way. That's got to be coupled with exposure, and the other ingredient is time. And those really are the three ingredients. That's what it will take. It's what it has always taken. To become a connoisseur of this, you will need time. Now, there are various, various courses available uh, around the city that uh, take uh, considerable more evenings than I intend to with you, and that will begin your study of music as a history course. And it will start with uh, as far back as the as antiquity, if you like. Uh, or the Renaissance, or the Middle Ages, and each week you know, work gradually up chronologically until you get to the modern age. Um, 
Uh, that's a good way if you're an undergraduate student, I think, and you are going to get a very subjective version of this. You are going to get my version of how to become uh, musically more cultured, but if you wish the standard sort of middle-of-the-road version, that is the way to go by all means. You can begin chronologically. My contention is that we don't fall in love according to any schedules. I came to music through whatever entry-level piece that attracted me as a child. I didn't start with the medieval period. I started with what was in my ear and would not go out from it. And every one of us has, I think, probably a similar story. Uh, for me, it was uh, a waltz by Strauss. I was 10, and I heard the Schicken aus dem Wienerwald, Tales of the Vienna Woods. And I asked my mother, what is that playing? She said, a violin. And I said, I must have one. <laughs> and she said, the same way you, you must be a fireman, the same way you must be an astronaut, the same way you must have these things. And so she got me the cheapest violin she possibly could. And she was very clever to do that. Uh, but that was my, my entry level piece. What it is for you, I don't know, but I would love to know sometime, but not tonight. But I would like to know if you would care to tell me. I'm always interested in those stories because they are so personal, how, how this comes to us. The terminology that I really, I really have trouble with is that we're speaking this evening and will for the next little while about what is generally referred to as classical music. And that is in itself a misnomer. Because if we really want to refer to the classical period, we're only talking about 50 years for music's sake. We're talking about 1750, which is what the textbooks will tell you, which if you would care to go and take another course somewhere else and they chronologically, they will tell you precisely that the classical period began 1750 and will mark it off to about 1800 and then we're into the Romantic period. Which, when I was a student, always seemed to me so funny. 1750 is chosen because it is the year that Johann Sebastian Bach died. Now Bach was certainly the absolute epitome, the apogee of Baroque music, the period before the classical period generally. So that we mark his death as the end of that period. But in fact, by the time he was an old man, he was Already, already considered by his sons, who were musicians, to be a fuddy-duddy. He was to be a, an embarrassment to the family that, his, that their father was writing in this old-fashioned, fugal, contrapuntal style in the 1740s. Couldn't he be kept quiet? One of Bach's sons, in fact, made extraordinary effort to destroy his father's printing plates for one of his greatest contrapuntal masterpieces, The Art of the Fugue. It was the absolute life's work brilliant mind who understood how to write count, uh, contrapuntal pieces. And one of the sons uh, moved heaven and earth to try and get rid of this because it was an embarrassment. Father is old-fashioned. The plays are destroyed. Copies were So we have the art of the few, but we're rather fortunate, I think. It always seemed humorous to me to start to start the period to say classical ends, ends right or begins right here because it, it, it allowed me, as far as I could tell, then all the artists got together on New Year's Eve, 1749, and said, tomorrow, boys, it's the classical period. <laughs> Can't take it. But that's the, it's a misnomer, what is going to be used, and you'll use it, and I'll use it, and we'll hear it, and everybody will understand, and we'll all be wrong when we say that. There are other attempts at naming it that I've always found uh, uh, equally unsuccessful. The, the one I hear, um, I think, second most frequently is serious music. <laughs> yes, we listen to serious music. My gosh, if you could read, and I will see to it that you can, if you could read some of the uh, correspondence of some of the great composers, Mozart, for example. Ah, yes, a serious man from time to time, but oh my. Some of his music he refers to in some of the most uh, uh, light-hearted and, and human heartbeat, pulse, red blood kind of terms. Yes, serious, but not serious to the point of lack of enjoyment, or that there's no humanity in it. And besides, who are we to say that we are the only ones listening to serious music? I guarantee you, your, your children or grandchildren who are playing in that garage band take it very seriously. And so does every jazz musician take it very seriously. So I think, it's a, I think it is a conceit to use that term. The, one, the other one that comes up, I listen to good music. Do I really need to tell you? Do I really need to tell you why I'm picking up? I listen to good music. Do you think a Porter Wagner fan doesn't think he's listening to good music? I doubt it. One that has come along that may have that may have some merit I can't bear to use, and that is art music. What on earth does that mean? And yet I see it 
I see it in articles, I see it in texts. The, if I had to choose another one, I'd choose this, though it too is an argument full of holes, and I concede immediately that it's full of holes, and that is we listen to concert music, which in the back of my head, I know that all kinds of musicians and all kinds of disciplines give concerts, what they call concerts, but when I think of a concert, I really don't think of anything else but orchestral, symphonic, or a, a recital, or a string quartet. That's what comes to mind. It may be useful, but classical is, in a, in, a, in a way, I find quite laughable, but nevertheless, if we're looking at those periods, then we could, we could be really uh, great hair splitters and say, we listen to music of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Baroque, the classical period, by the way, the Romantic and the modern, though as the 20th century comes to its close, <laughs> things that were considered modern in 1905, I find uh, pretty much old hat now, but the concert going public doesn't. You can still upset people with Stravinsky's Sacre du Printemps with the Rite of Spring, which is uh, a work uh, given at the time of the First World War. Now, it upset a lot of people then, but that it still does now says a great deal more about the way in which we've been uh, exposing uh, students to listen to music, uh, a great deal more about what kind of music we consume. If anything, the concert repertoire of symphony orchestras has fallen into what I'd have to call the play it again Sam mentality. If we were to put away some of the best known works that are repeated over and over, give them a rest for five years, I think to bring out Beethoven's Fifth after nobody having heard it for five years, we'd leap off the floor three feet to hear that piece again. But it would not harm any of us to begin to listen to some repertoire outside of the, the mainstream orchestras and certain radio stations <laughs> play what I could only describe as classical top 40. This narrow band of repertoire. And this is, this is unique to us as listeners. If, if the same is not true in film. Though we all recognize that Bogart made great flicks, we know how to try to get a Bogart movie, that's not a problem at all. But if you really want to know what's on the waiting list at your video rental store, it's the latest film not the oldest, they're the ones you have to reserve. But that same desire, that same approach to our entertainment and music is not. We're doing the musical equivalent of, we'll hear that Bogart again, please, and again, and again. Classical music, and we'll use that term, it's been around a long time. It's been around a long time because it is of enduring cultural value. Hamlet has been allowed a long time because it is of enduring cultural value. Shakespeare felt, I think, everything in the human condition. No matter how dated the English and what a challenge it might be to grasp it, it's a challenge worth, worth uh, standing up to. The human condition is reflected in all of Shakespeare's plays in one, one way or another. The love, the war, the jealousy, <coughs> sharper than, than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. All those family <laughs> things are there. Everything is there in the human condition. And so we, we keep him. He is a classic. He has continuing cultural value. I had the great privilege of being in a master class, the concert master of the Boston Symphony. And he was, uh, at that time, in his 70s and a grand, a grand old man. And we were all teenagers young instrumentalist violinists, and you could ask him questions or make comments or try and engage him. And there's invariably somebody who wants to, you know, make the lecturer look, uh, put him on his toes anyway. And this, this fellow opined to the great concertmaster of the Boston Symphony. He said, you know, maestro, the, uh, the music of today will be remembered long after Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms are forgotten. <laughs> and uh, he looked down at the student, and I'll never forget his answer. He said, you know, I agree with you, but not until then. <laughs> <laughs> what makes it work, what makes it work when we come into that entry-level piece for us, and I, I wish to bring it down to, to, this, to the simplest level, because that's where it belongs, and where it comes for us is melody. Melody is really music's miracle. It is the connection to humanity. The Harvard Dictionary of Music is a great reference piece 
any serious music library, any serious musician that's actually doing this for a living, not to own a copy of the Harvard Dictionary of Music is missing one of the, one of the basic tools. <coughs> it defines melody so inadequately that I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> Harvard Dictionary says melody is a coherent succession of pitches. <laughs> a coherent succession of pitches. And my response to that is, coherent to whom? If we listen to music of, uh, of the East, of, of, uh, of Java in particular, which is wonderful percussive music, of certain uh, Japanese traditions, all Oriental, all Eastern music, this sounds, to me, and I have a fair music education, sound meandering. And they may sound meandering to you, too. Um, Western music, to Eastern ears, sounds meandering. Yet we'll, oh, both sides will say, well, there's the melody. Don't you hear it? The melody is this and this. It's very obvious. It's plain. It's straightforward. What I found um, a little more, uh, no, not shocking. That's too strong a word. Is that too many, not too many, far, uh, far more uh, Eastern musicians <coughs> comprehend our Western music and play it for us with extraordinary facility than the reverse. It is, it is an incomplete comprehension of both, of both this centuries old Eastern tradition and a re the recent, really fairly recent acquisition in this century of Western music in Eastern cultures. And how do we use it? They hear our music, learn how to play it, and can present it magnificently. We hear something in the background that would go well in a restaurant. And that's above the length that we, in which we generally indulge ourselves in that. There is no melody there. Uh, this is atmospheric. This is musical wallpaper to us. And uh, it's a great failing on our part, because there is a melody there. And our comprehension of it needs to be challenged. But we're still, if I told you that um, that uh, I have a, a tape of various uh, Kyoto ensembles and that it was their classical music, it would be a stretch tonight, and I would lose you. But believe me, there's a melody there. We're using music too often for non-musical purposes. Music has become, for all of us, over-available. Uh, and in particular, the one thing that should have helped music, that musicians believed would, was electronic media. In fact, it is the thing that may indeed kill it. Aaron Copeland, great American composer, gave a lecture here in Toronto in, uh, oh gosh, I guess it so the middle 70s, and uh, I had to take the train from Belleville, which is where I was born, and come here to, uh, to hear Aaron Copeland. And I was, uh, I was so excited to see a real live composer. And the first thing he mentioned in his, the first of his two lectures uh, was that over-availability was killing the concert. You can, he said, hear a Beethoven symphony by taking the subway. Um, you can hear a really fine string quartet in the elevator. And the insidious use of music electronically is, uh, well, it's just that. It's dreadfully insidious. One of the, uh, one of the examples he's, he used, I, I recall, I'll never forget, was the eggs you had for breakfast were laid by chickens that listened to Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. Because they are using this magnificent music because it has an immediate physical effect. On, on living creatures, certainly if it does on chickens and frogs and house plants, <laughs> remember what it does to you. And you can't say, well, it doesn't affect me because I don't like that piece of music. You can be listening in a bar to something you absolutely despise, and if the beat is put out to you strong enough, you will tap your toe in spite of yourself because your body responds. So your internal organs respond. Try the, music of, the musical manipulation of shoppers to put people in the mood that since malls have come along, you know, this is the concept of leisure shopping. It's not that, it's not that uh, uh, old a concept at all. The idea of going out to shop for fun is a very, very recent one. Music helps make people be in a kind of mood where they'll, well, what the hell, let's put it on the card. <laughs> Music makes you drink more in bars. If they want to speed up sales, they don't play ballads. Pick up the tempo. Andre Previn in his autobiography spoke about traveling in an airline that, an airliner that had uh, encountered atrocious turbulence. 
and this was very frightening. And as a, as a frightened flyer, I can certainly speak to a, a great sympathy with, with that. And the stewardess put on what he was pretty sure was a sort of um, combination elevator music in Lawrence Welk. <laughs> and it was jolly and cheery and all the stuff the planes going up and down. People were very sick and they were afraid. And Previn grabbed her as she went by and said, I know why you're doing this. And if we're going to crash, put on some Beethoven. <laughs> melody. We understand Western melody. No trouble. Eastern melody is a mystery to us. Yet Western melody hasn't been all that well comprehended. Some of the greatest composers have been accused in their lifetime of being unable to write a melody. This is a wonderful book that I recommend for you. It's called The Lexicon of Musical Invective. It's all the bad reviews <laughs> over the centuries. And one of the reasons composers get, or, or critics get remembered at all is for the, the extent to which they were wrong. And, th and this book is absolutely marvelous. Now, Beethoven, who gave us melodies that, that children can sing, here, here are just two examples. The second symphony of Beethoven is a crass monster, a hideously writhing, wounded dragon that refuses to expire and, though bleeding in the finale, furiously beats about with its tail erect, still alive. <laughs> in Beethoven's lifetime, 1810, Beethoven is bizarre, he is Baroque. He takes at times the majestic flight of an eagle and then creeps in rocky pathways. He first fills the soul with sweet melancholy, true, and then shatters it by a mass of barbarous chords. This composer harbors together doves and crocodiles. <laughs> a review from 1810. <coughs> Brahms. Brahms had the great misfortune to come under the pen of not only a musical intellect, but a great writer who wrote under a nom de plume, George Bernard Shaw, wrote music criticism for years. George Bernard Shaw knew whereof he spoke, and he wrote under the pseudonym Cornetto di Bassetto, which is a <laughs> now extinct clarinet. <laughs> Shaw wrote of Brahms' Requiem, and Brahms put his soul into this Requiem mass, my word. Clara Schumann, whom he adored, had passed away, and his own mother, there was everything of this man's soul in his requiem. The Review, George Bernard Shaw in the newspaper of the World, November 9th, 1892. <laughs> Brahms' requiem has not the true funeral relish. It is so completely and ponderously dull that the very flattest of funerals would seem like a ballet after it. <laughs> <laughs> and take this last one. I think I picked people whom I know who would recognize their melodies. Consider this, Puccini. That'd be a better song. At the first hearing, perhaps much, perhaps most of Puccini's opera sounds exceedingly, even ingeniously, ugly. <laughs> Every now and then one comes across the most ear flaying succession of chords, and then the instrumentation, nearly always characteristic, is often distinctly raw boned. The sound is hideous. This composer shows a diabolical ingenuity in massing together harsh, ill sound. As for harmony, Puccini, like some other of his Italian countrymen, shows that his ear is far less sensitive to the unpleasant effects he makes. That's from the Boston Evening Transcript, <laughs> April 12, 91. It's a fellow named Mr. Apthorpe who wrote for the Boston Evening Transcript who didn't like me like anybody. He is, in here, he is in here time and time again. I do recommend his wonderful reading, Lexicon of Musical Invective. It's by Slonimsky. I'll leave it up here in a break if you want to, uh, if you want to see it. So we come to melody, and we will stay with melody a while. What is melody then if it's not that uh, coherent succession of pitches that the Harvard Dictionary wants us to, wants us to subscribe to? Uh, I like this. What is a melody is what sounds like one to you. And what we may have grown up with may be melodies that are familiar, but it is, it is ever possible, especially with electronic media, to hear a new melody all the time. There is so much to learn, so many melodies to hear, and when we develop our personal culture, we have no trouble determining what we believe to be a melody. One writer 
I love to quote Thomas Mansart, refers to melody as one of life's <laughs> universal truths. A melody tends to be related to the voice. Oh, I like that. Melody is related to the voice. Franz Josef Haydn used to instruct his composition students in the following way, and the translation from the German comes out approximately like this. If you think you've written a good melody, if you're absolutely convinced you've written a good melody, get up from the harpsichord, take what you've written, stand away from it, and sing it. And if it sounds well after you sing it, you have succeeded. If it doesn't and you think it needs the instrument, start again. It all comes back to the voice, the original instrument. When I think of melody and I think of how we can imagine how music must have begun, this is absolutely the very root of it all. The, uh, the compliment I admire most from people who are not musically educated listeners is one that I think hits right on the nerve of what makes a great performance. My uncles used to say, I remember them saying the same thing about some instrumentalist they hear or, or, or whatever. They'd say, uh, boy, he can make that violin talk. <laughs> now think about it. That's, that is beautiful. That is, that is a pure compliment. He has taken what is essentially that a compliment regarding the first instrument, and they've, they've reduced it down to speech. They've reduced it down to song, is what it is. Yes, he can make it talk. Absolutely true. Now, a melody tends to be related to the voice, to the vocal cords. And our vocal cords are, after all, nothing more than muscle. If, our, if they tighten up, the pitch of our voice will rise. And the intensity of our voice will rise. And if we get relaxed, it doesn't matter if you're talking to the world's highest soprano, ultimately in conversation, as the evening goes on, things relax. The speaking pitch of the voice will, will lower. This also comes from fatigue, but it can start early in the, early with simple relaxation. The muscles, muscles relax, your voice pitch will descend. Now, that same kind of tension relaxation comes to us from what we hear, too, not merely because we're making sounds when we speak. You hear a siren in traffic. See if your whole emotional reaction to it next time. You hear the siren, and your emotional reaction will go, even if it's only for a second, and you think, oh, hell, another ambulance. But for that first moment, you, you become tense. And as the siren goes by and the pitch descends, be relaxed. Not merely because the traffic has changed, but that pitch has affected you physically. It goes up, it goes down. If the pitch does, you do too. When that siren is passing you next time you're in traffic, see if you don't feel a sense, no matter how brief, of winding down. Melodies, back to my darling uncles, who would say he could make it talk. Melodies have a structure like phrases of speech, particularly Western melodies that we're all accustomed to. They are phrases of speech. There's sentence one. <laughs> you know it's not done, not really because you know Mary had a little lamb, but you know that's unsatisfactory to end here. You want to be here, to the end of the piece. So the, the, the second section, then the answer. Home base. There's the punctuation at the end of it. There's two separate phrases. It's almost like question and answer. Even if you, even if you think of, uh, of this melody. Question. We want to get to here, to get to home base. All the phrases are that way. And the, to reduce it down to something that simple is absolutely the essence of what I hope we learn in the next six weeks, that it is that simple. It is that straightforward. What a musician needs is no different than what we as good listeners need. We need, and I firmly believe this, a well-developed spirit and the qualities of the spirit, which are above all a function of personality and of taste. Your taste, not good taste, your taste. Let me say it to you again. I believe this wholeheartedly. The developed spirit, qualities of the spirit, which are above all a function of personality and of taste. When we have student, music students come to us, we seek the general enrichment of their individual culture. I'll see musicians playing through a piece. I've used Bach so many times this evening. 
let's use Mozart for a moment, a, a Mozart minuet, and not to have looked at one single Watteau painting, not to have read any of the poetry of that time, not to know a single thing of his life or the conditions or the fact that he was in the most revolutionary period in European history is to miss out on the elegance of that piece, on the buried rebellion that is inside of that personal culture that the music student has to have, we must have too as listeners. Development of imagination, power of analysis, all of which permit the conveying of what we really want when we go to a concert. We want something emotional. And that permits the conveying of emotions. And for us as listeners, if the, if the musician has all of these things intact, for us as listeners, it allows us to receive those emotions if our culture, if our personal culture is developed as well. Because we can't receive them from somebody unless we can do it too. Now, music without emotion is available. And I don't care for it. <laughs> I think we are dealing here in one of the most human to human uh, communications. And for it to be emotionless or without any kind of feeling whatsoever uh, is something that I, I really don't understand why anybody would want to pursue that. Yet careers can be made that way. <laughs> Technical means will influence musical result. Once again, that's technical means can influence musical result. The nature of the physical gesture of a conductor will influence the response of any sensitive player. And for this moment, we are all going to be sensitive players. Sit up, put your feet on the floor, I beg you. Please. I want you, we have never discussed this, true? True. When my stick comes down, and you think it's time, I would be grateful if you would say, ta. Are you ready? That's all there is to it. Come with me, please. Ta. Again. Ta. Very few people said ta. <laughs> Some people said ta. Others said ta. This one. Ready? Ta. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. Nobody said ta. Did we discuss this? Absolutely not, because you saw it not when it was here, but that the method is in the preparation. The same way the pianist is lifting his hand, and we, it's too late by the time he has to think about it, by the time his hand is touched the piano, it's game over. <laughs> this one. This one. Ready? Nobody said, nobody yelled. <laughs> We ever discussed this? You have got you have got something that every symphony orchestra member has to have. Right? Yeah, it is all possible. But what happens is that the technical means will influence the musical result. You just gave me three different dynamics. Some gave me fortissimo, ta. Some gave me pianissimo, ta. Some gave me legato, ta. Some gave me staccato. Ta. But I had all these possible variations from everybody here based on your interpretation. In fact, I submit based on your personal culture. And how quickly are you going to respond to how well I have been able to, to convey any of that to you? By the way, there's a conducting lesson in this course. Today. <laughs> <laughs> there is. You're all invited to bring a baton. We are, going to, we are going to find out about conducting one entire night. Everybody is welcome. So if you want to get a stick, you bring it. It won't help, but bring it. <laughs> the nature of the physical gesture of a conductor will influence the response and the feeling, or the response slash feeling, of any sensitive player. And I submit you're a very sensitive group because everybody wondered what the devil was going to happen when I did this. So you're sensitive in spite of yourself. All right? You had very good responses. Extremely good. It's impossible to give a performance that's compelling if you have to think about technique. Now, this may be obvious, but I'm going to, I'm going to dwell on it regardless for a moment. Uh, if I had to think about that, when I lift my hand up, am I going to be doing going to say, Tom, I can't, be, I can't be doing that. You have to do it with me when I bring it down because I don't think about it anymore, because I spent 30 years learning how to do it, and now it's second nature, the same as when we get into a car. When we first learn to drive, we adjust the mirror, the belt, the rear view on the side. Where are we? Am I close to the curb? The ignition? Is it in park? OK. Nobody who's been driving for a while thinks about those things. Now you get in and drive. 
And that's the technique of driving, or at least starting the car and getting out, which is really what we did right now. I started to. Because that's a rather short piece, Tom. <laughs> Without technique that serves the performer, if the performer serves the technique, I'm sure you'll, I'm sure you'll agree upon a moment of reflection, a performer serving his technique will not give a compelling performance. Imagine, imagine the soliloquy from Hamlet if the actor had to think about how tense his lips were, whether he was using his diaphragm, how open is his throat, you will not get a very compelling version of to be or not to be. Not a chance. And so it is with musicians as well. The grammar of the phrase that we were just talking about at the piano, the grammar of the, of the phrase, requires a kind of comprehension that does not allow time for concentration on technique why it takes as long as it does. Nowadays, we come to uh, the music as an industry, the entertainment industry in general, the idea that any suggestion, any suggestion at all, that the player, that the interpreter, is in a sense, even the slightest sense, more important than the composer, that won't be well received in the 90s. Not a chance, no. The thing to say now is that we serve the composer, there's a book out now by a conductor I otherwise admire tremendously, um, the late uh, Eric Leinsdorf, who believed wholeheartedly in his title, The Composer's Advocate. Indeed we are. But it's on the strength of our individual personalities that we make compelling music, or give compelling plays, or create compelling sculptures, draw compelling pictures. But that idea that the player is as important as the composer. How about that? That won't be well received in the 1990s either. But music lives, music lives in the personality of the musician. But nowadays, there's this curious need to conceal personality in playing and in, in presenting music behind this carefully literal execution of the printed score. And the score, as one of my teachers said to me, the score, when you look at it, is an indication of what can be, not what must be. To carry the analogy back to theater, how many different ways are there to read the same speech bars? Countless ways to read the same speech But we have come to a time uh, where the interpretation of music, that this literal adherence to the score, has taken out the personality of the individual, which is why or at least suppressed it to the point, which is why there are so many anonymous performances available to us now. Extraordinarily anonymous performances. Yet well within living memory, there was a time when the great violinists of the day, such as Heifetz, or uh, Misha Elman, or Chrysler, were all wonderful players, but you could tell one from another. Their personality, their personalities were very evident in their playing. Now, I think there is nothing quite so common as last year's competition winner. They are, and I, I think it's dreadful, really. it's, it's, it's going to be, it's dangerous to, uh, to giving concerts as uh, electronic media. They are disposable. And the public has a great need for the latest, youngest, um, whatever, uh, soloist, you name it. Uh, and that person uh, will be used immediately, and then they want the next winner of the next year. And the anonymity of producing uh, so many soloists, so many musicians, who uh, are essentially spinning out the same interpretation of the score each time, is, uh, is the suppression of the personality. And that is what is robbing us of compelling <coughs> music, I am finding, in, uh, in concerts. Could you just, yeah, hi, Nora, how are you? Hi. Can they just wait outside? We're going to break in uh, about another 10. Now, this argument in favor of personality of the, of the interpreter, I, I uh, submit as the best argument the response of the public in favor of interpreters with personality. I have seen it. I have seen it many times, especially sitting in the audience. See if, you don't, see if you haven't experienced this. Somebody will come on stage, and there'll be an immediate change just by the way that person walks out there. It's a kind of, oh, and I've even heard this. Before they play the note, oh, he's good. <laughs> Play. <laughs> it's true. And why? Because something came off the stage that had absolutely nothing to do with music history 400. You know, he's there. There's a personality there. The three tenors frequently sing very badly, but who cares? They don't have at all. 
<laughs> and actually, if you want to see what really made, uh, let me tell about, talk about that, because I'm sure many of, the, many of you may have those, uh, those recordings or videos. It's the first concert that mattered. <clears throat> it's the first one that mattered. They never recaptured it. There was a strength of three personalities there. Uh, some, and you can tell, can you tell who's the weak personality? Please. <laughs> Uh, they're all there, and the strength of those three personalities together is what makes it compelling. There are errors all over the place, and we don't care. What happens now is, because of electronic media, we are accustomed to something that never used to be, and I think it may yet, it may yet go away, but I uh, haven't seen any signs of it, and that is we are accustomed to an unnatural perfection. When you go and buy a CD, you are listening to the result of mix and match and balance and splice and dice and my god, ain't it perfect. When you go to a concert, you are listening to one take the way it used to be. What are they invented direct to disc? Remember that? Direct to disc? That's not you. <laughs> That's what it was. That's what concerts were. That's what a performance is. Direct to disc indeed. I recall that with the I was astounded that that came up. Anyway. That is this, this uh, and I find it rather a technically perfect and very inhuman kind of perfection. There's arguments, as I mentioned, is in favor of the personality. I see I can support my argument by simply showing you the box office, but not that the box office is the reason for it all, but as Giuseppe Verdi said, never read the critics, read the receipts. <laughs> <laughs> listening to music, and no one will say that he couldn't write. In listening to music, we are dealing in two sides of communication, mainly one, but I think in two sides. As you came in tonight, or for those of us who haven't, uh, that, that I haven't met you before, you're not Symphony subscribers, so this is the first time, there is absolutely no way that something between us isn't communicated. You can't not communicate. I didn't say you can't accurately, but something gets communicated. When you're on the subway, you can walk in or, or wherever, you're going to, people suss you out. It only takes a couple of minutes. They're made up their mind. They play that French, that Parisian cafe game of what is she to eat or eat to Hecuba. They figure it out, and they're wrong or right. It doesn't matter. But they make an assessment about you. We learn a lot more about anybody in this room tonight by listening to them than we do by looking at them. And you are going to say, it's what you say, not why you look like it. No, that isn't my point at all. I don't think it's the words in the slightest. You can't not communicate, but what tells me about a person is not so much what they say, though they may say wonderful, witty, charming, and elegant, intelligent things, but in fact, what it boils right down to is how we sound when we say it. <coughs> Any number, try it. Try it. Don't think lawyers don't know about this either when they're asking a question in, the, in trial. Really good ones understand how to read the voice. Body language, too, yes, I admit that's a visual, but, but tone of voice has everything to do with it. How often have you been in conversations where merely the pitch of the other person has you back the head saying he means it, or he's lying to me? Which has absolutely nothing to do with the text, everything to do with the pitch, everything to do, to do in fact, with our personal vocal music, with our personal instrument. Right back to the same thing again kinds of sounds people make, the kinds of sounds people make are apt to tell more about what's going on inside them than the actual sense of their words. I believe, this is why this is the subjective course and not the uh, logical reasonable course, I believe that sound, the sounds we make, are the supreme means of conveying our feelings. And those sounds certainly come out of a violin. And I, for me, have always come out of a full symphony orchestra. That those feelings are conveyed in sound. I quote again my, my dear friend and mentor, Thomas Massard, who wrote, hearing, or listening, however you want to call it, is like truth. It is infinite. How, I asked him, and he said, you can find parts of the truth you can live to 100 and know many, many important truths, but in the light of what we could know and what we could learn, we'll never possess anything that could properly be described as complete truth. What a blessing, since listening has the same 
the same possibilities to it, or perhaps lack of possibilities. No, I think same possibilities. <coughs> we'll never, we'll never hear completely, and that's the joy of it. There's so much to hear. Many good listeners have no musical training. I like them. They have no musical training, but they hear better, and they hear significantly better than many educated musicians. And I wouldn't say that to please you. I believe it to be absolutely true, because professionals have had something knocked out of them or that at least the attempt has been made to knock it out of them as listeners, and that is the ability to just go for the big picture. How did this concert make me feel? The professionals may have had that sort of brute fact of listening to details, and that will turn his attention away from the whole. I suggest that without too many details, you become more of a natural listener. And I hope over the next six weeks I can show you the details of this, without detracting at all from your gifts as listeners. It's like this. Imagine if you were listening to a love poem and you missed all the feeling because you were occupied with trying to determine the meter. <laughs> That's what it is for some, for some musicians. And I find, I find it personally, I've spent most of my life now uh, listening in an analytical fashion. And in fact, when I can only relax and forget about the analytical parts, I have to go back to the pieces I first listened to intently as a, as, a, as a boy. As Thomas Jefferson said, I find the older I get, the things I love best are the things I love first. And indeed, they still are to me. The essential is a matter of feeling. It's tone, it's not the text. And I can prove it to you. I have a song this evening on our tape that's in Czech. How many people here speak Czech? One, two, you are dismissed. <laughs> I guarantee you will not need to speak one word of Czech if you will listen with open ears to be moved by the feeling in this piece of music. I, by the way, I don't consider former, formal musical training to be destructive of any kind of artistic sensitivity. There are, however, always those who put up intellectual roadblocks to the enjoyment of music. You see them at concerts all the time. I don't care for it much. They, they want it to be respectable. And you know, music is not made to be respectable. Music is much better than something to be made that is respectable. Music is made to be loved. It's not smarmy. That is its purpose. If anything else, my personal uh, uh, take on it is that it's to bring us closer to the divine, but not respectable. If you listen and understand the principles of what it is you're listening to, I am certain that with time, as I mentioned at the beginning, details will follow. The great writer Paul Valery said in his definition of intelligence, intelligence is the capacity to reduce things to manageable dimensions. Capacity is the, the intelligence is the capacity to reduce things to manageable dimensions. It's no great accomplishment, according to uh, Valery, to, um, to deal with ever-increasing kinds of complexity. It takes genius to reduce it down to some manageable uh, thought. Paul Valery went on to write of Leonardo da Vinci, and I'm sure a few people in this room would disagree that da Vinci was a genius. He said, da Vinci's most intellectually complex decisions may be reduced down to which is longer, this piece of length or that piece of length. <laughs> To reduce to that kind of simplicity is utter genius. And that's what I hope we don't lose as we begin to listen. I have a tape of several examples before we, uh, before we break. Uh, and I am asking for you to speak now. I'm going to play each example. And I want to know not what it may well, maybe what it makes you think of, but I want you to tell me more importantly how it makes you feel. If you get pictures, you're well at the, you know, if you see if you see things when you hear music, I'm with you. When I, when I was a kid, I always saw, I saw stories, complete stories with pieces of music that had utterly nothing to do with it, and that's perfectly all right. There is no right or wrong. It's what's right for you. Here we go.
no idea. We have no idea how close we are. Yes? Um, um, there is no right, by the way. If you think of weather, and I tell you, you don't have to, it doesn't matter. If you thought of poultry, that's fine too. <laughs> <laughs> Flowers in a mountain meadow. Very good. Yes? The end of the world and then the morning after. That's what you mean. Good, good. What feeling? Who got what feeling? I can, I'll take all the imagery. I'll take all the imagery. Yes, but. Something lovely and fragile oh, with impending doom approaching. Good. And then good. a resolution. Japanese love story. I was going to say the Great Wall of China. Please, please. What a peace. Doom. Doom. Village. Astrid Hansen. Yeah. Ah, good, good. Did you say that? No. no apprehensive. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, there's, so I think there's a fair bit in there, but that's subjective. Yes. A lot of, a lot of cloud, cloud, cloud shadows. Okay, I'm going to tell you what this is. You're right. You're right. You're right. There's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of possibility in this. This is a wonderful piece by an American composer, an Armenian background. His name is Alan Holfanis, and this is a kind of green slash piece. It's called, And God Created Great Whales. And it begins with a Japanese fishing song. Mm -hmm. And it sets up with some of that Eastern uh, melodic technique that I, that I spoke of earlier. It sets all this atmospheric uh, texture. Is the Japanese fishing song that goes there. And then he interpolates just at the very last moment, because I didn't want to give it away too badly, the actual sounds, the courting sounds of the humpback whale. I find a wonderfully atmospheric piece. But yes, I, I like the uh, foreboding. That, that was good. I like that. It does give you that. But it gives you images too. I want to hear images too. This one. This one. and mountains. <laughs> you know too well. <laughs> That's somebody who doesn't know fjords and yeah, mountains. Very plaintive, very plaintive and, and lonely. Which and made you sad. feel okay, oh, lonely yeah. and sad. You have to find it a touch schizophrenic. <laughs> and that this, this change to this, I, it sounds to me, if somebody told me that this were, uh, uh, that this were a uh, orchestral sort of kaddish, if this was a, a lament, I would, I would eagerly subscribe to that theory. It has a, a Hebraic feel to that melody. It's actually by Edvard Grieg, and it's from the um, uh, Pier Gint. What else? Who got what? Who got what? I got something entirely different. Yes, good. Well, that's what you got. So what was it? Exactly physical. My whole body responds. Uh -huh. It either soothes me or it makes me shrink or it makes me feel sick. Mm -hmm. Or it makes me quiver because it's not something. And I don't have mental pictures, I, feel. I don't need mental pictures. Some people are getting mental pictures. I want to know how you feel. You're, you're exactly what I'm asking. I want to know how it made you feel. I think it's hard to hear that and not feel it, not just sorrow. But, but we're accustomed to, we're accustomed to, if it's in the minor key, it must be sad, which ain't true. And uh, yes? Well, I, it was very joyful at first. Yes. I thought it was more serene. 
Oh, au revoir. Okay, Serene. Yes, it certainly has that about it. Most definitely. Let's carry on. I don't care if you know it. I want to know what you Italian? You think Italian is his first language? Yeah. Yeah? No? Who else? You're singing that language, you make it sound like you speak it. I think he's most unconvincing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really do. I think, I think he's very handling it. And very much the bragger. Yeah, oh yes, he's the bragger. Do you know this text? Do you know what this text means? No, Because you're very much the bragger, and this is, this is quite a conviction. And you don't speak Italian? This is a great conviction. Believe me, it's good. He's bragging. If you know this opera, if you know this opera. But if you don't, if you take somebody to the opera for the first time, this is a great one. Go. This is a perfectly, and don't think I'm saying this is beginner's opera. This is, a, this is a masterpiece. But this is Barbara Seville. And in the first moments, and what a terrible thing to do to Figaro. The moment the curtain goes up, he has to sing the prize song right away. There's no, there's no, there's no getting into it. Bang! You've got to sing this number right here. Yes, there's, there's bravado. What else? Yes, good. You know why? Oh, good. He's, he's, that's very good. How, how do you get the frantic out of that? Get that feeling. Uh, thank you. <laughs> exactly, well, yes, it is a frantic feeling. The text is all about all the things he has to do, and he carries messages, and he's he's involved in scandals, and he curls hair, and he does all these things around town. He is the uh, factotum. <laughs> Anything else? I don't think the familiarity of this would bar any kind of re-examination to understand what it does to his familiar. Yes. For me, it's uh, one. Big joyful piece of music. It sure is. I'm my my fun toy, you know. Yeah. And I, I want to do something. You can't miss. You can't miss. Can't miss. None, of them, none of them can miss with that. It is joyful.
kiss me, darling, my regiment leaves at dawn. <laughs> <laughs> so For me, that will always be a tall ship and the stiff bees. Yeah, that's right. What was that serious? You said an idle one. An idle one, yes. yes. Languid is the feeling. I'm sorry? It's very languid feeling. Indeed it is, you know, and to conduct that piece, since we all are masters at Tom, <laughs> there's not a moment that doesn't look like this. And nobody would put a sharp edge anywhere there. Very true, very languid. Somewhat me melancholy. I mean, yes, sure, it can make you very melancholy. Yes. I remember. Yearning. Yearning. Oh, doesn't it just? You know, man, this is the adagio of Spartacus and Phrygia from the ballet Spartacus by uh, Cacciatore. And uh, yes, this is the love moment, no question. <laughs> and, and it'll forever make you think of what? <laughs> This was modern. He took as an example T for two by the uh, And he said, T for two, or two for T, or T for two, or two for two. It doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere either. Well, see, we could all disagree. Ladies and gentlemen, we should take a break now. Um, and please make it uh, just 10 minutes because the brass quintet is going to come in and set up. And when we come back, uh, they'll have set up here. So if you could get round them, as I mentioned earlier. Please, 10 minutes and only 10. Eh? <laughs> Absolute favorite, favorite misconceptions about brass instrument is held by many, many children and surprisingly large number of adults. And that is that all you have to do is blow through one end and press the button and music will come out. <laughs> Confess. Uh -oh. It's true. Many believe that. I stumbled. You stumbled. <laughs> In fact, I mean, you know, it's really dangerous to talk to, to talk about instruments that I don't play in front of people who play them extremely well. But I, I espouse this theory that in fact the instrument is only existing here to act as an amplifier for the abilities of each one of these people to have a fabulous musical embouchure. Of course, a good instrument makes a difference, but essentially it's these two lips that are the musician that we're about to hear. Take them out pieces off. If you would, I'll, I'll stop interfering. Take the mouthpieces off and make a sound because no, they don't with have the this, mouthpiece. With the mouthpiece. This is. Okay? That's what's happening at the symphony concert. Unfortunately, you don't get to hear that because it, be, it would really you know, live it up. Some of our uh, <laughs> most bored, it's unfortunate. Some subconscious desperately need that. But you take that sound and you run it through several uh, feet of brass, and uh, you get something that you're much more accustomed to hearing. But that's what's happening. We need something to vibrate, a column of air to accept the vibration, and this instrument to amplify it in its own way. Let's begin with the trumpet. Norm, you're on, and I'll time you have 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like me to say a few words about I'd like you to say a few <laughs> words about the trumpet, you and Joshua. Oh, okay, okay. The, the trumpet, as you all know, is it's been around since the beginning of time, as we were just discussing. It's one of the oldest instruments. It was first used as a signal instrument for, for thousands of years before it ever became a musical instrument. What we have in the uh, modern brass quintet is a, is a modern version of what, what used to be basically a bugle. It didn't have any of these mechanical devices to change pitch. Uh, part of what Kerry says is true. Most of our pitch is uh, it's judged by our facial, what we do with our lips, or our embouchure, as we call it. And I'll give you an example of that. Bugle notes, essentially, are in a series that sound like this. So you can play all those little tunes that we're all familiar with without using the mechanical devices. Did you turn around and just show over here too, so everybody can right. see? <laughs> Sounds like this. You don't need any valves for that. <laughs> what the valves do, and they were invented around uh, the early part of the 1800s. Uh, they went through various configurations. They had some keys, like on a saxophone at first, and before that they had no keys and no valves. It was all done with the lips. Uh, what the valves do is they open these smaller 
sets of pipes, which makes the instrument longer or shorter, depending on which combination you choose. And that changes pitch and bridges the gap of those bugle tones, essentially. And then you have a full series of notes, like on the, on the piano. sorts of nice little tunes. the intonation of the instruments and the uh, and various different pitches of instruments. You'll notice that I have a smaller one, which is just a soprano trumpet. It's exactly an octave high. And you'll, you'll you notice that. that so everybody sees oh, sorry, I keep forgetting that there are people everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> 360 with your demo here. There we are. There we are. <laughs> oh, I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> this is exactly an octave higher than this. And you'll notice that it's like the piccolo flute in an orchestra. It's, it's merely the baby of the parent. And it's designed for playing in the high register, as you'll notice in this piece that we're about to play for you. OK. Rita. OK. Um, this is going to get the trumpet players upset, but the horn is just as old as the trumpet. Um, because what happened was that the trumpet started off with the way a piece of tubing was wrapped, sort of made it work for the different types of events that it would be used. A bugle actually came in two forms, and one, one was just wrapped around and it was about this short, okay, and, and a complete wrap, and it was wrapped and it was that long. And actually it was more used by the infantry because the infantry were light of foot they would have to use smaller instruments so that they wouldn't get stuck up in the trees and the bushes and everything. The cavalry, because they were on horses, decided that they wanted a bugle that was much longer. Stagecoaches, they didn't even bother wrapping it up. They just went with the full length. <laughs> um, when they started, uh, the British started turning this around and started saying, OK, well, when we're out doing our fox hunting, we still need this instrument of call. But they started wrapping it in a round type of wrap, which is where the horn became a descent of dove. So it's basically all got the same history, just different uses made it <coughs> wrap differently with, with that way it goes. Um, again, the history of the valves, actually the history of the valves started in two places. One was in Dublin in the mid uh, 1830s, and actually in Canada, it started here in Toronto about five years later without the two of them knowing about piston valves. So it started off in two locations, and the gentleman in Toronto was actually a bugler who decided he was sick and tired of playing just the five notes that were on the bugle, and he wanted to add something to play a few of the notes in between. So that's sort of how that came about. So if you think about the hunting horn, and that's sort of the idea of the sound of the horn. <laughs> just to demonstrate, and hopefully I won't break out laughing doing this, I want to just enforce what Carrie said about the lips making the sound. Each note that we play is actually off our lips. Okay? It's not that you just buzz one thing and you get the whole myriad of sound. Now, just hang on a sec before I laugh here. <laughs> pitch with our lips and uh, when the valve instruments press a valve down all that does is extends the tubing 
lowers the pitch. Mm -hmm. On a trombone, it's it's all we don't. I mean, these been around before the valves. We didn't really. <clears throat> this was almost a no-brainer. <laughs> no so there, that's a lot of trombone players get that. Kind of oh, time. <laughs> <laughs> so the no valve, and the way we change the length of our our two is just <coughs> we just move our slide, and that's the slide trombone. It's lovely sound. Tuba. <laughs> well, the tuba is not the oldest. <laughs> One of the newest, but uh, mine looks like the oldest. <laughs> this particular one is a veteran of too many hot summertime Dixieland jobs and that sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, the, the tuba is, is the, uh, well, I guess I'm sort of the bottom of the band of being called worse. <laughs> Rita and I are what we call, we're the conical bores of the group because our instruments actually, unlike the trumpets and the trombones, which have tubing, which is really the same width all the way through until it gets to the bell, tuba and the French horn both get gradually wider as they move from the mouthpiece to the bell, which gives uh, those instruments a much softer, mellower, and more beautiful sound. <laughs> <laughs> now, I suppose since all these folks have stood up and, and played some very uh, lovely uh, passages on their instrument, that I should play something on the two of too. So I'm going to play um, a Canadian composition, which some of you may recognize. This was, uh, this was written in, in an extreme hurry in a studio in Vancouver, I believe. You may recognize it, too. Mozart. I was talking to you earlier this evening about the question and answer aspect of, of phrases and the similarity between musical phrases and, and language phrases. This is a look at a particular form that is very uh, straightforward to get hold of. The rondo form, if we were to express it in letters in a graph, if there's an idea that we'll call A, and A keeps coming back. There's A, and then there's B, which is entirely contrasting to A, and then you get A again. And then the next idea is C, and then you get A again. So it looks like A, B, A, C, A, D, as many times as the composer has contrasting phrases or answers to that question. As many answers as he has that he believes um, will, will, will make good responses. I'm going to let them play because we've been waiting a long time. Here's the, you'll hear the A. I may get them to play it again, but uh, just piecemeal. But here we go. This is Turkish Rondo by Mozart. Thank you. 
just up to the double bar before A. This is the theme that you hear that keeps coming back. Huh? This is A. Okay? This next rondo, this is another rondo. This is by Mouret. You will recognize this theme. And forget about Alistair Cook when you hear it. <laughs> Think about... We're going to hear the A theme. <laughs> Take the A theme. <laughs> That's for the jazz week. That's next week. <laughs> I'm going to let them play something, I promise, but this I want you to get. Okay? Please, continue. Pick up your That's not good. No? 11. Okay. Just a theme before 11. <laughs> <laughs> the second statement of the first theme. Bar 9. Bar 9. Nine. Into 9. Nine. some really good cocktail conversation. <laughs> what I love about the theme from Masterpiece Theater is how plainly the structure of the rondo comes from the theme. <laughs> 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 I have to Gibson. All right. I use that line all the yes, time. Yes, yes, use it all the time. Never works. <laughs> so much, so much of the repertoire that we listen to is in the form of a dance. The rondo is certainly, a, certainly a form, but it, can, it could also have been danced in its day. Uh, the dance form, assembled as suites, and we get all kinds of dance suites throughout music history. That was, in fact, instrumental music's probably greatest labor was playing dance music. The idea of sitting down to a concert to hear symphonies is a long time coming in music history. It's not the first, it's not the first thing to come along. Instrumental music serves the court, serves the rich, serves those with the time and the uh, structure and uh, the social wherewithal to need live music for dancing. So dancing playing an important part. We have Mozart at the end of his career, in the last year of his life in 1791, engaged only as the composer of dance music for the court. Not, mind you, I say only. The man who held the job before him was paid two and a half times more the salary that Mozart was offered. So it wasn't a bad, it wasn't a bad job to have. But sublime dance music was a great and important thing to do in those days. He is, he is uh, easily translated in one of his letters uh, in reference to the job of composing dance music for the court. They pay me too much for what I do, too little for what I could do. Perhaps poor man's greatest suffering was to know his own worth. 
<laughs> this is a minuet. A minuet, typical dance, courtly dance of the period. Its form would be, I think, in the, the whole overall structure, we look at something called a minuet, then a contrasting section. Does this have a trio before I say yes. that? Yes, okay, minuet and trio. Uh, and the trio is simply a, a contrasting section, and then we return to the minuet. So the overall grand structure would be the minuet is A, the trio is B, and after we play the B section, we go back to A again. So this is a very straightforward A, B, A. is our A theme that, that's going to come back again and again, and I'm sure you recognized it if you're listening carefully when the return of this theme occurred. Last eight bars of the trio. So the contrasting section, the trio portion, it ends, and then they do what's called a da capo back to the top. See the end? fail you. That, what's, that's what makes it so. That's what makes it so. Do I do have a good one? Uh, yeah, you don't want to skip the snow? I think we should skip the woods. Uh, 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 no, no, let's skip the gavotte into the alleluia. Do you have this? Okay. Yes, yes. Mozart, eh? Mozart, eh? Yes. <laughs> This is here for the sheer joy of it, because I like you here. <laughs> 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 talk about that. People see that at concerts all the time. <laughs> what, what, we're blowing out of the instrument <laughs> is not spit, <laughs> by and large. 
No comment. <laughs> it is condensation. I think if you're lemonade glass in the middle of summer, except it's on the inside, not the outside. OK, and then you blow in warm air through a brass <laughs> instrument. You're going to get the weather pattern in there. A little bit, with a little, little bit of this mixed in. For <laughs> The hand? Sure, let's stop. Absolutely. Why do you have your hand in the bell of the French horn? Uh, <laughs> because the tuba player is not close enough. Um, stand, stand up and do it. The idea of the, that is that because the horn is so awfully wound, as Flanders and Swans, two British comedians, used to say, the idea is that the hand continues to curve so that it actually sounds a little bit more mellow than without it. It sounds. Can you demonstrate the difference? Where you place your hand in the bell of the horn will definitely. That's it. Okay, hallelujah. Both sides. Hallelujah, it's ready. Quintet was bringing this contrapunctus one. I spoke to you early this evening about how Bach, by the time he was nearing the end of his life, was considered to be a buddy daddy by his sons. And yet, uh, this was because there was something going on in Europe that was all the rage called the style galant, the gallant style. The thing that, that uh, uh, was coming to uh, France, certainly and definitely in the courts of the Mannheim, one of the great uh, important cultural centers of the day. And here was Bach still writing fugues. 
If you know how to sing, row, row your boat, you have the basis of the most simple, straightforward piece of counterpoint. Now, that's not a fugue. That's, strict, strictly speaking, a round. Huh? We sing a round. But it has all the earmarks of a fugue. So one voice starts, another voice joins in. And it sounds to you, when you're listening to a fugue, as if it ended several times. Well, in fact, it has. But they all do catch up eventually. <laughs> This particular contrapuntus is from Bach's work that was that his son tried to destroy. The art of the fugue based every single one of these exercises on the same theme. Bach was great at doing that. He would take one tiny germ of an idea and use it over and over. That's it. Which we get this. I know it's a different key for you, but the box was in D minor. Yours is in what? A? Yeah. A. voices. I'm going to ask the players just to give us the first bit of this again because it's important. I played the subject for you on the piano. The subject or if you like the theme, all right? The theme, which keeps coming back. In a fugue, we have a, a statement of the theme and we have an answer immediately. And the answer is the question again, okay? So if the question is deem, ba, 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 be, da, 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 the next voice to come in will also play deem, ba, 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 and the first voice can't play it along with the second voice, so he must play something called the counter subject, something that will go with the question each time until eventually it is resolved. And you heard, of course, how wonderfully Bach resolves this at the end. It's really, I get a nice feeling when I hear that, especially when it ends in the major. That's a wonderful effect, because this piece has a lovely ray of sunshine at the end. We just have the opening. This is called, in a few, the exposition. Doesn't matter. The opening, OK? The beginning of it, where we ask the question. Where we hear the subject go ahead. 
I want you to count, if you would please, count, it, or rather be aware of, not count, the answer is five. Uh, count, be aware of, be aware of each entry of the subject, of the theme. This is your good night song. Victor Ewald, um, who played the cello and keyboards. Was found very comfortable. It was found. Yeah, it was found sort of a, in a trunk, yeah. in somebody's Maybe attic. Dusty. You know, somebody, a brass player, happened to come across it probably, and, and then the, eventually it got published because it's actually quite nice music. It's very romantic in nature, uh, very lush, and. Uh, and we enjoy playing it because it's nice. It has a lot of intricate voicing, uh, orchestration, parts of the orchestration, very lovely. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. 
if you have, anybody has any questions for these wonderful players, any, anything at all, any question you've always wanted to ask a brass musician. Yes, ma'am. Could she, did you say hold your tuba? For sure. Don't be sorry. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> so starting with brass is a good idea. Yes, ma'am. The two trumpets are such different colors. Why is that? Well, we actually the three have, trumpets are we actually have different three different. This one is is raw brass, raw brass. It has absolutely no <clears throat> plating or no lacquering. Usually, when you see shiny brass instruments, there's a, a coating they put over this raw brass finish. His instrument is gold plated. Oh. Oh. That's quite a contrast. <laughs> <laughs> if I polish this, it'll be just as shiny as this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it won't stay that way. This one is coated with silver plating. It's brass underneath, but it has silver, a thin layer of silver to give it that, that lovely shine. And that has a thin layer of brass over top of this. That affect the sound? And it affects the sound to a certain degree. And some players have their uh, preferences. Some people like the sound of gold instruments. It's a very minute difference at best. And it, projection quality changes slightly with the different kinds of platings they put on the instruments. But essentially, it's this that. Good. Someone else, please? We have a few moments. Yes. What's the difference between the cornet and the soprano trumpet? The cornet is the same pitch as the B flat trumpet, oh, except, technical now, except yeah. it's <laughs> except it's a conical bore instrument like the tuba and French horn. It gives it a mellower sound yeah. and generally played with a much deeper mouthpiece. But it's the same. We have the same pitch range. It's, a, it's the same pitch range and it's the same family. The same notes are available. The same notes are available. <laughs> it just has a more mellower sound to it. So what's my sound? Yes, right over here. Uh, to the horn player, you referred to the origins of the instrument from England, and yet it's called a French horn. And I understand an English horn is actually a, what is it, a baritone clarinet? It's a woodwind instrument. No, it, it's the uh, sort of the uh, father to the oboe. Okay, it's a double reed instrument like the oboe is. I call it a demented cousin. Well, <laughs> um, it is about six inches longer than the oboe, and instead of having just a slightly tapered bell like an oboe or even a clarinet would have, it's actually got a bulb at the bottom. It's sort of what you think of as the snake charmer of the uh, <laughs> well, instrument. Let's get it straight. We're talking about two separate families now. Yeah. The English horn yeah. belongs to the woodwind family. Yeah, it is cool. not, no, no place here. But there's, yes, an English it, horn. It's, it's, although it was English, um, there was a lot of interaction between England and France as far as their, uh, with the court life and all that back. So it started off just being known as le corps, which is French for the horn. And then for when they translated corps into horn, they just added the French horn. It's just a matter of semantics, although um, the, the, it was more the vowels were the invention more of, of the British and the uh, uh, early Canadian. There's all thing. kinds of, it's good, I'm sorry. There's all kinds of folk etymology about the origins of the names. For example, I, I read, and it was put forward as absolutely the gospel truth, that cor, the English horn, comes from the French cor anglais. All right, okay, so in French, that's cor anglais, English horn, English, English horn. And that it was translated anglais, as in angled, because it is angled. So it became, became from the, from the uh, angled horn to the English horn. But the horn is a hunting instrument that Rita, that Rita uh, very uh, uh, plainly showed us earlier. Without all this, without all this mechanism in between, it was universal where, wherever the hunting was held. And hunting was a uh, pretty big social activity then. There was no poo-pooing blood sports. Um, this was this was not at all. This was something that was done uh, that uh, and made absolute difference in your social status. I, I read uh, a quite reliable report of uh, Frederick the Great, who liked about three things in this world, playing the flute, his army, and hunting, <laughs> who traded the use of one of his regiments for a month in exchange for a rack of antlers that he admired so much in Poland that had all these uh, various points on it. It was a big, big social activity. And the brass players in, in those days were of, uh, musicians were not held in the greatest high esteem, but you could certainly get high esteem being a, being a brass player with a cavalry regiment or being the, uh, the prince's uh, favorite horn players for the hunt. Absolutely, it wear a feather and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Spoil them. Any other questions, please? Please, any questions? 
Here's, now's your chance. The petting zoo is open. <laughs> That's it. Next week is William Westcott, brilliant jazz musician. I know you're going to enjoy it, especially if you have no feelings whatsoever about jazz. He is starting from from uh, ground zero before he reaches DEFCON 4, okay? It's going, be, it's going to be wonderful. My uh, request of you, every single person here, please, is responsible for one chair, the one you are sitting on. Please, please pile your chair back at the back. Thank you so much for coming out.